Hope everybody's well. Welcome to our CMAP bootcamp. CMAP mortgages, mortgage advisors, all that stuff really. Hope everybody's well. We've got a couple of topics for you today. Had a great weekend. I went down to Cornwall this weekend. It was fantastic weather. Fantastic weather. Just checking down to see if we're online down there on uh, on YouTube and Vimeo, which we are, which is great. Let's have a quick uh, quick check for any questions coming in. Got a few coming in, which is fantastic to hear. Yeah, I had a great time down in Cornwall. The weather was fantastic actually until uh, late Saturday and the rains came down. But uh, hey, welcome to a new week. Um, I'm looking forward to this week. It's, it's looking good all around. So what have we got for you today on our live stream? We're going to talk for 15-20 minutes or so. And I've got my whiteboard as always. And it's always great to hear questions from, from everybody when they come through. I've been reading about Thomas Cook. Of course we all have. Um, terrible. Terrible situation, Thomas Cook. Been reading about them, magnificent uh, company, um, going back to you know Victorian Edwardian days. Um, don't just book it, Thomas Cook it. I remember adverts in the eighties when I was when I was younger. And uh, okay, they've gone bust. And uh, for for CMAP followers, um, the the kind of uh, messages for us really, apart from being awful situation is that um, that they have tried to get an agreement with their creditors. They tried to get a CVA, which is a company voluntary administration. A CVA is a company version of a personal um, IVA or bankruptcy, but it's for companies. And the idea is you, you, you'll gather around a big table and you get all these top-notch CEOs paid hundreds of thousands of pounds to try and do a deal with the creditors, and they failed. So one, one wonders why they're paid so much money. But that's another deal, isn't it, at the end of the day? Um, so they've gone into compulsory liquidation. Now, liquidation is, is a key word there. You hear that in the, in the CMAP. That's for companies. Individuals go bankrupt. Companies go into liquidation. And they've gone into compulsory liquidation of Thomas Cook, which is very, very sad. But it's another example of disruption. The internet is disrupted. I can't remember the last time I booked a holiday via a holiday company. Um, I'm sure they're around, and you know, when you go abroad, you kind of do. But you know, we can all do it direct ourselves anyway. But that's a by and by. Um, the other thing to think about very quickly is that um, it's the biggest repatriation, apparently, of British citizens since the Second World War, since Dunkirk. It was just The British government have chartered forty planes or so from around the world and they're zooming off to pick people up but the people to worry about are those staff members sitting behind those counters right now on the phone who are the last to know what's going on and, and they're, they're going to lose their jobs or they're not going to get paid on friday um, you've just got to think about these people because they're the ones going through the most pain the, the people on holiday will have a couple of extra days holiday maybe most of them are paid paid for companies to be off anyway so they're fine and they'll get home <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's people that are left behind that, that I always worry about in those days. So, you know, all, all bad stuff, really. And what's the main message of, of uh, this morning's CMAP boot camp? Well, I'm into property now because mortgages, of course, property is all about, um, about housing, CMAP 2, CMAP 3. And I was reading in the uh, the paper over the weekend, because I've did a lot of reading, really, when I'm on my holidays. And I read a, um, a firm or an organisation called the National Housing Federation, which is a quango. And they came out with these statistics that so 8.4 million um, unaffordable uh, people in unaffordable homes, um, insecure or unsuitable. 8.4 million people in this country, UK, are in unaffordable, insecure or unsuitable homes. And I think that's scary stuff. You know, I came home last night from a, a long drive and we've got a home here which is warm and tidy and clean. But 8.4 million people aren't, and that worries me. And the biggest uh, concern there is social housing. And I want to talk about social housing with you because it's, 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 it's the answer to that problem. Um, and I don't know why we don't do it. Um, I'm not going to do a Hugh Fernley Wartham stall or one of these people that starts... Um, shouting with banners outside Parliament saying no, no, no. I'm not going to do that, but the fact is that social housing has gone wrong. Let's explain a little bit about social housing. This obviously impacts you on your, your CMAP syllabus quite quite a lot. We're talking here about social housing, so let's put a little title up there for you. Now, CMAP talks a lot about social housing, council housing, right to buy, property construction. So there's lots of links here for you to understand about the history of social housing. What I want to do is just draw a little timeline for you to show you what's happened and maybe where we're going to go in the future. 
So let's go to uh, to now, which is sort of 2020 or so, and we'll go back to 1919, which is 100 years ago, virtually. And then I want to look at the future because that's the key that's going to get rid of this eight or so million people who are unsuitable housing, which is absolute um, diabolical, really, in, in in the modern society that we live in. So let's all go then. Go back to 1919, of course, Treaty of Versailles, end of the First World War, and the the British uh, government decided to do something about housing. Now they noticed this, of course, with the uh, troops on, on the front who, who they, they, they were able to see the British population for the first ever time. You know, eight, nine million uh, guys and girls were, were drafted into the, um, the, the, the forces and they were able to see first time what the average British per the guy looked like. And the guy that had been brought up in a slum or in bad housing, they weren't fit spittles like the upper class were. And uh, the department decided to do something better. They thought it was health that was the issue. People weren't as they should be. So they decided that housing was a health issue. And that's the big thing. There's this thing called an Addison Act. I won't write too much about that. You know, the Addison Act. You might have heard about it. <coughs> the Addison Act was a fantastic piece of legislation introduced in 1919, which decided once and for all that we as a nation were responsible for the health of our people. And, um, and, and the big issue was housing. So overnight, it granted money, lots of money, for 500,000 homes now. 500,000 new homes to be built by local authorities. And that was the biggest thing ever going. And grants were given to local authorities to build these houses. And they got on with it. They got on between 1919 and 1939, which is obviously the start of uh, the Second World War. They built hundreds of thousands of houses. Thousands were built to populate, uh, the, the, you know, to, to house the population. And these were mostly uh, standard construction. If you go around the British countryside, towns, villages, you see standard properties being built with standard. Um, construction methods, nothing fancy, and, and they're very mortgageable. You, you probably see these in, in property specs, very, very mortgageable, 1920s, 1930s, bay-fronted windows kind of thing, outskirts of town. And it started to, to look great because people no longer had slums, slums were cleared, and, and the, the population were housed the first time. One thing I always noticed, actually, I'm sure you noticed as well, um, I, I call them pebble dash. Now, I was brought up in a council house that had pebble dashing. I was amazed by why somebody would put pebbles in cement on the walls of your house. And the plain fact was that the bricklayers were either died in the First World War or they weren't very good, they were not bricklayers. So the, the, the bricklaying capability was, was awful. So if you take off the pebble dash, the bricks actually are terrible. And the bricks construction themselves are pretty awful. So pebble dash was designed to cover it. There you go. First uh, cosmetic covering for a house. Okay, so. Construction carried on, of course it stopped in, in the Second World War, all, all human um, individual construction stopped in, in the Second World War, of course it was all down to military means, wasn't it, at the end of the day, and that's fine. But after the war, more money was pumped in, then of course we had the bombings, inner city bombings, particularly in London, big cities, Birmingham, large swathes of, of slum Victorian dwellings were bombed, therefore the population needed rehousing. So from 1945, to 1965, let's give you some dates here now, 1965, again a massive social housing boom was created, enormous hundreds of thousands of houses built, lots of money pumped into it as well, and, uh, and, and that was that. But the problem this time is there was a shortage of, of traditional housing materials, bricks, mortar, all those good things, slates, there's a shortage, of course there was, and you know, Britain was bust, we didn't have the money. So we were looking for shortcut ways of building. And that's why, of course, concrete was drafted in. Not so much before the war, after the war, definitely. And pre-cast or cast on site, concrete slabs were used to build houses. Being very problematic for mortgage lenders. Most lenders won't touch those. The reason for that is they're, um, they're, they're, they're insecure, they're not, not safe, concrete, a rust. It was the steel reinforcement often that rust. Steel um, frame properties, BISF, you had concrete frame properties, you had wood frame properties, asbestos was used quite readily, and all these materials lenders don't like, and surveyors will pick those out very quickly. So if you get a mortgage on an ex-local authority property, built between, say, 45 and 65, take a look very closely at the construction method used, because it may well be unmortgageable.
which is unfortunate. Um, and that was that was big deal. The other thing, of course, were high rise. High rise flats were were built for the first time. Uh, an idea from the European continent. Uh, we started building great blocks of flats using concrete, of course, reinforced concrete. And we all know what's happened to those things. They've all come collapsing down. Um, but it was designed because, you know, if you build upwards, it can basically house a whole, whole terrace street, but you house them upwards in hardly any space. And nothing wrong intrinsically with high-rise flats, but it's just the way that they're built and the construction methods, etc. And, you know, it's just, just, just flats, isn't it? So that's 19... 45 to 65. Now, after 65 onwards, they carried on building council properties into the 70s. Of course they did. But the big one now for you that you need to be aware of with your um, CMAP is 1980, uh, 1980, where I was, well, how old was I in 1980? I was about, um, about 17, 18, I think. I was a punk rocker and a hippie. Now, 1980 was the Housing Act, of course, of 1980. And this was the Conservative government at the time. It was their big flagship proposal. And what it basically did, of course, is it allowed all those people living in council properties that they, they, they rented. And my mum and dad had a council house they rented from 60, 65 onwards as well, um, to buy it. And that was the right to buy. The right to buy was, was just the way it was. And people agreed or disagreed. It's political, of course it is. But it, um, it did allow a lot of council tenants to buy. A substantial discount and that's the whole point behind it the the discount was clawed back so typically you get clawed back put that in there for you so although you've got a substantial discount according to how long you rented the property for if you were to flog it within three years you had to pay back the um, the discount to the council or an element of it the council had a first charge on the property so their, their clawback, if you like, had the first charge, and the lender therefore took a second charge. But they didn't mind so much because there was plenty of equity, and many lenders were doing 100% mortgages. I mean, we, we were making hay whilst the sunshine in the 80s. I was in banks and building societies, estate agency, and we did a lot of mortgage lending for people buying their property. Uh, lots of equity. Uh, it allowed them to borrow more than the purchase price so they could do it up, build their conservatories and extensions and all those things. And it was fantastic. And, and people bought a load of properties and the numbers show it because the numbers show that uh, at the beginning of 1980, you had six and a half million, there you go, six and a half million council properties, which is a massive amount of the housing stock. And they were decent properties. They got fixed. They got looked after by the council. My old granddad had one till he died. We never bought it for him because the council were going to look after it for him. Um, they, 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 were, well, they were roomy, spacious. The Adsnap gave them space gardens. I remember my back garden went on for miles. And my mum and dad had a great time there. Bought it and sold it eventually. Made, made a lot of money from it as well. A um, couple other things quickly happened there. By the way, the number of... Um, properties. I, I give that when we end because it's quite scary what's happened now. But um, a lot of these properties that were sold, of course, some of the non-standard construction caused problems. So we had a rescue scheme to bought in to rescue people who bought properties that were on mortgage. Well, how they got that, I don't know, but everybody was lending after the other. Um, the message really, of course, is if you're lending on a right to buy, take a look at the construction method, really. Don't rely on a drive-by or desktop valuation, they're not going to give you the, the true construction method of the property as well. So that was the right to buy still going on, although it's been pulled back in some of our countries of the UK, which is probably the right thing to do. The, the big problem, of course, with the right to buy is that um, the councils were quite happy to sell the properties, make a lot of money, but the money went back to the government um, and, and, and councils weren't given that much money back again to rebuild, so there's no rebuilding going on. So the number of properties in, in the social sector went from six and a half million down to two million. There's two million left now in the um, public sector, owned by housing associations now as opposed to councils. And that's where the problem lies, because the, the report I showed you earlier that there was eight and a half, nine million people in unsuitable properties. If you had this large number of council properties still funded by central government, you wouldn't have that problem. You wouldn't have that problem. And there's nothing wrong with that. We do, 
we do have a duty of care to our population to look after them. Crikey, you know, it's, it's what, the 21st century. We're the fifth biggest economy in the world, aren't we? We should be doing this. And the biggest irony, and whether you like this or not, and um, you might have seen the figures, um, quite scary, 40%, there you go, 40% of the properties that were sold under right to buy to various people, and we sold onwards, are now owned by buy to let landlords. That's scary, isn't it? So 40%, almost half of the, all the council house properties that were sold are now owned by private landlords who rent them privately to people. So they're still rented. How scary and how ironical is that? But that's getting a little bit political. We won't go there, will we? So that's social housing and mortgage lending. I hope that's been a, a good piece of information for you. <laughs> There you go. Nice one, that one. Up. Um, let's get that a rub out for you. And let's see where we've got any questions coming down. Remember, if you've got questions you want me to talk about on these live streams, please do. Happy to, to cover them for you. People on the boot camp get to ask questions readily. That's the, um, that's the online CMAP training course that we offer. It's very popular indeed. So if you want to ask questions on that, I, I cover topics for people that um, want, want to cover various topics. Anything else you want to talk about, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, okay, let's finish off on a little, little, little tip for you then on marketing or prospecting. Because if you're a mortgage broker and you set up in business, you've got to be a little bit careful now. We're getting a bit of a downturn in the economy. Mortgage market's beginning to sort of shake a little bit. House sales are going down. So you've got to take a look at that. Plenty of lending. Plenty of lenders, too many of them, they'll be emerging now as well. So we're going to take a look at where you're going to get your customers from, where you're going to get your clients from. Prospecting is something you should be doing one day a week. Uh, my advice here when you're prospecting is you, you've got to be prospecting for one day a week. You know, let's put that title up there for you, prospecting. I love that phrase, it's like gold mining, isn't it? Um, effectively, you've got five days to work. Now, most people, of course, work, work more than that. You know, work Saturdays, that's fine, I'm not going there. But if you do, as a mortgage advisor, you should spend one day prospecting. There you go. You should spend one day on self-development. And you should spend three days earning fees. In other words, dealing with customers. If you do that, you'll be around forever. Because the CPD will keep you ahead of the curve. So you won't be disrupted. The internet's coming in, of course, disrupting the sector. And the, uh, the prospecting will make sure that your sales funnel is full of new clients and you always have business. Don't get sucked into doing five days fee work. Easy to do. I can earn a lot of money with this business, you say to yourself, but it's scary if you do that. Don't, don't go there. So where's the biggest thing? What's the message for something? The biggest message for one is Google. Google. I want to talk about Google because we all know about Google. We all know about internet search and I keep getting emails from people offering search engine optimization. Please, Paul, your website, we love it a bit, but it's crap, you know? You're not optimizing your search engine. And I get thousands of these blooming emails coming through. And the fact is they're out of date now because Google's suddenly changed things. And the biggest change to Google is Alexa. Now, if I, if I shout out Alexa, I'm going to have six, you know, six speakers around this, uh, this office area will start talking to me. I've got a voice assistant, as you have probably as well. You've got Google Assistant or Alexa, which is Amazon's. And the whole point about voice is it's growing massively. In a few years' time, none of us were typing into a Google search engine. We'll all be asking for information. We'll be looking for information via voice on our phones, tablets, devices, whatever it is. And the, the point here is that Google Assistant or Alexa so here's a picture of my Alexa speaker. When I talk to Alexa, she, in fact it's a she of course, will give me an answer. She will say an answer and it's one, one answer. It's not like a whole page of answers. She'll give me one answer. And that's where the internet's going. So if you ask a question on Google, Google now gives you answers as opposed to websites. Now, have a look at yourself. When you search on Google, what you get now is drop, drop down menus of answers, which is your question. And those answers, of course, have come from websites, which are quite hidden well. But Google doesn't want you to go there. It just wants you to read the answer and be happy because the Google Assistant and the Alexa, of course, is giving you that one-word answer as well. Now, that's the problem because if you search engine optimize your website and hope to come up on Google organically, you ain't going to get there anymore because most people will get their answer from the Google drop-down menus and then move on, which, again, is quite scary. So what's the message here? What could you do as a mortgage advisor? Well... Whether you're going to rely on your website to pull in business is pretty unlikely, unless you're the likes of Woolwich or, or TSB or somebody like that where you've got the budget to do it. 
You could use AdWords where you buy clicks, people put in keywords, and you get sponsored at the top. Yeah, you could do that if you wanted to as well. But you've got the budget to be able to compete with the big boys like Halifax and people like that who've got millions of pounds in budgetary money. So you could do um, AdWords if you wanted to as well. Um, try and think about the, the other search capability as well. Where else do people search now? Okay, go on, on Google, on Amazon Alexa. You could get yourself a skill. You could, you could create a skill on Amazon. So if you, if you ask Alexa an answer, it might give you your skill, which is your, your sort of um, podcast. So you could do podcasts via Alexa. We're moving into that area. Um, you could certainly use YouTube. Do you have a YouTube channel? YouTube is um, growing now to be one of the biggest, most popular search engines. My, 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 my kids, they search on YouTube rather than Google. So if people search on YouTube or go visiting YouTube, do you have a channel there with some videos of you, what you do, that kind of stuff, you know, with your logo on it? You should do, it's free. And uh, that might pull in some business as well. Obviously, social media comes into its own. Find out where your customers are, where do they hang out, and then hang out there as well. So it may well be Instagram, it could be Facebook that your customers hang out. So make sure you're around and available there. But of course, referrals and testimonials and um, being, being referred is the key. So make sure your LinkedIn profile is big and bustling because other professionals might refer you on that. Accountants, state agents, solicitors, whatever connections you've got, make sure you have those. Um, and other brokers might refer you as well. People might refer you. But LinkedIn is not where you're going to get your clients from. Um, find IFA firms that have got big client banks. That's the big one for you. They've all been rationalising over the last four or five years since RDR, state agents. And, and sorry, no, IFAs. And the thing about IFAs, they've got these big, bulbous client banks that they've been maintaining for years. And they don't have the people to go trawling them and contacting them. And IFAs don't like doing that anyway, like dealing with clients. So link in with some of those. Find some connections in your area where maybe you could um, service the client bank to give the mortgage advice. There's certainly something to look at as well. Um, Facebook, Instagram, all those things come into their own as well. But don't forget referrals. Make sure that you contact every customer you deal with and ask them for a referral. Make sure you're around, of course, and noticeable, but referral management is key. So there's sort of things you want to be doing. I wouldn't rely on Google anymore. Things have moved on since that time. And don't forget, one day prospecting, one day CBD, three days fees. I've been doing that for 30 odd years now, and it works really well. Hey, nice idea for you. Hope that's been useful. <laughs> Bye. There you go. Hope you enjoyed that one. Hope you enjoyed that little little sales tip there for you. I'm sure you did. Okay, I'm going to wrap up now because it's uh, it's time to wrap up. The sun's still shining here in Cheltenham. I hope it is with you. I hear the clouds are coming in later, and we've got like uh, two weeks of rain, consistent rain. I'm up up to the smoke tomorrow. In fact, I'm up for two or three days now, working with some corporate clients milling around the tech place. Autumn's kicking in, getting busy, isn't it? Hope you're busy. Do keep in touch. Ping some questions over to me. Listen to the podcast, listen to the YouTube videos. Uh, and we'll keep doing this next week, probably same time next Monday, 10 o'clock. Have a great week.